Welcome listeners to the latest edition of the Inside Track. My name is Richard Goldman. Today's guest on the Inside Track is Lisa Donahue, Managing Director and Global Head of Alex Partners Turnaround and Restructuring Group. Lisa has been a restructuring professional for more than 20 years, guiding underperforming companies through complex negotiations and operational restructurings. During that time, Lisa has occupied numerous C-level posts for various high-level reorganizations, including serving as Chief Executive Officer for New World Pasta, Chief Financial Officer for Calpine, Exide, Umbro, and Atlantic Power, and Chief Restructuring Officer for SEM Group, Exide, and the Puerto Rico Electric Power Authority. Currently, Lisa is serving as the Chief Transition and Development Officer for Westinghouse Electric Co. Lisa is a member of the International Women's Insolvency and Restructuring Confederation and the Council on Foreign Relations, a fellow of the American College of Bankruptcy, and a senior advisory member for Her Justice. In 2007, Lisa was named the IWIRC's Woman of the Year. In 2008, she received the TMA's Mega Company Turnaround of the Year Award for Calpine. In 2012, Lisa received the AJC Financial Services Division National Human Relations Award. In 2015, she was awarded the Her Justice Humanitarian Award. And in 2016, Lisa was an honoree for Tina's Wish, the Honorable Tina Brosman Foundation for Ovarian Cancer Research. It is an honor and a pleasure to welcome Lisa to the Inside Track. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So Lisa, before we sort of dive into your career, your educational background, uh, and all things that kind of have brought you to the place where you are today at Alex Partners, I just want to take a general picture of some views that you have on today's distressed practice. So in your opinion, what's the most challenging aspect of being a restructuring advisor? Wow. <laughs> I think it I think it varies from situation to situation. I think when you get into something that's crisis, the challenging part is trying to add some process and take a little bit of the chaos out of what's going on. And that's hard for people that have never gone through it before. So when you're kind of parachuted into these situations and you've got a management team that's very, very good in managing regular way, but there's a crisis, it's it's hard to get them to move and do things that might seem intuitively not right for them. Right. That's that's one of the, the bigger challenges, I think, in, in a crisis situation. And the other thing is, is if you're in a situation and you're an advisor, you're, you have to compel people. You have to persuade people to, again, move in a direction that intuitively they may not want to go. Hmm. What is uh, the most significant way in which your practice as a restructuring advisor has changed over the course of your career? When I think about the practice of the of the turnaround group at Alex Partners, I would say that there's a couple of ways that that it's that it's evolved. Number one, we've expanded significantly internationally. Um, number two, we've tripled in size, more than tripled in size. When I joined the practice back in 1998, it was you know 40 people, and we were in Detroit, Chicago, and New York. Now we are across the world. And we've got you know 300 people globally, and we're doing some of the most fascinating, complex, you know, complicated restructurings around the world. So I, I think you know the growth is probably the the biggest change oh. over time. I know that uh, you've had the opportunity to provide testimony to Congress. What was that experience like? Scary, kind of. <laughs> um, it's it's intimidating. Yeah. It's 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 intimidating. It's it's very formal and. Um, I actually had to do it a couple of times. I did it for okay. the U.S. Congress, but during my time in Puerto Rico, I did it for the Puerto Rican Senate, the Puerto Rican House, um, as well as you know various energy commissions. It's um, you know it, it's different. It's very formal, and I, I think when you first go in, at least for me, it was it was a little intimidating. And they have a clock, and you're only allowed to talk for five minutes, and that's tough. So you find yourself reading your statement and making sure that you're under this five minute time because you're not exactly sure if they're going to kind of pull you off or or stop you. Um, and then once it got to you know the questions and answers, it became a bit more comfortable. Right. Is it tougher being a witness uh, in a bankruptcy case, providing expert testimony, or providing testimony to Congress? I think it's tougher being a witness in a contentious bankruptcy case. Why is that? Well, 
because they tend they they're very prepared with their questions. Um, they're typically advocating a position in in a bankruptcy case. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a limit of time when they can ask you questions, and conversely, on the congressional testimony with the questions, what my experience was they were really trying to get to the truth. They didn't enter the proceeding with a bias one way or another. Whereas when you're testifying in a bankruptcy case, if the other side professional comes up to ask you questions, you have a pretty good idea where it's going to go. Right. Okay. (laughs) Speaking about the bankruptcy system and the U.S. restructuring system, in your opinion, what's the greatest strength of the U.S. restructuring system? I think it's um, transparency. It's it's clarity. I think the process is a, is a good process. I think when people enter into it, they have a pretty good idea of where they want it to be and where it's going to come out. The absolute priority is something that gives investors clarity, mm-hmm. and um, you know it's a consensual process. And I think that it gears itself toward the right solution. Let's take the flip side of that question. Uh, what's the greatest weakness of the U.S. bankruptcy in court restructuring system? I think sometimes there's a situation where parties are tend to to take the approach of the strategic litigation to get what they want. And I think in some instances, it drags on a bit longer than it should. And I don't think that that's productive. Mm-hmm. That's probably the only thing I can think of at the moment. All right. That's fair. Let's uh, sort of take a couple of years back uh, down memory lane and, uh, you know, learn a little more about you, I guess, personally and professionally and your education background. Where'd you grow up? I grew up in a town outside of Boston, Massachusetts called Medford. Uh, Where'd you go to college? I went to Florida State University. How'd you choose being someone who grew up in Boston or, you know, growing growing up outside of Boston, end up going to Florida State University? You know, it's funny, considering the Boston area has something like 55 colleges and universities (laughs) within the region. I think the way that I think about it is I'm one of seven children. Okay. I shared a bedroom with four sisters. And when I was thinking about where I wanted to go to school, I knew I wanted to get out of the region. I knew I wanted independence. I wanted a, a football school. I wanted a big university experience and I needed a university that I could afford right. because I was, you know, paying for it through student loans and working. So Florida State was one of the ones that that popped up. The weather coming from the northeast was Very definitely <laughs> definitely a good feature. And um you know, I I thought I wanted to go into business and they had a pretty good business school. So, you know, as a 17-year-old, I I thought about a lot of those things and I think it was a lot of it was about independence for me. Right. Any secondary degrees? No. no. So not many people perhaps know this. I didn't know this until doing more background, but you did not start off your career as a restructuring advisor. You entered the workforce as a lender. You worked at Boston Financial and, and Equity Corp, uh, which I guess you'll tell me whether you that meant you moved back to Boston or if that was elsewhere. But uh, you know, tell us why you went into sort of the field as a, as a lender and why working for Boston Financial and, and what that experience generally was like. You know, it's funny. I I came back from, from school and moved back to the Boston area. And I did work at Boston Financial and Equity. And, and they are a third-party finance company, so it's not a traditional bank. And the types of loans that bf and did, it was um, asset-based lending. It was early-stage loans with warrant kickers. And it was high-risk lending. So... As you would expect with high-risk lending, occasionally it doesn't work out. Right. And I ended up meeting, needing a restructuring advisor. And at the time, I didn't even know that a restructuring advisor type of career existed. But I knew that as a lender with a defaulted loan and a potential fraud and we didn't have clear visibility into what was going on, I needed help and discovered through asking contacts in Boston that people actually did this for a living. Right. And I got connected with a firm called The Recovery Group out of Boston. And we worked, we hired them to help us figure it out. And once our matter was resolved, the founder there 
said, you know, you're pretty good at this. <laughs> what do you think? And I knew a couple of people that had worked over there through personal friends. So I interviewed with Stephen Gray, who was the founder of Recovery Group. And um, I made the move and worked at Recovery Group for about five years before mm-hmm. I then made the move to Alex Partners and moved to New York City. So what was the impetus for that move? You know, I, I loved Recovery Group. It was such a great place to work and learned so much from Stephen and the other partners. And they were regional. They tended to do a lot of middle market. The, the type of work was similar. It was interim management. It was advisory. It was Chapter 11s. It was, you know, transformation, operational type stuff. But I wanted a, um, a bigger platform. And I had seen and heard about Alex Partners, that it was a, a growing practice. It was more national in scope. And I wanted to see if, if I could work at Alex Partners. Working at the recovery group, working at Alex Partners, I'm sure you've encountered many professionals you know, who have had an impact uh, you know, on your career, on your development, and on your growth. You know, of the many professionals you know, for whom and with whom you've worked, which one would you say has had the most impact or the most influence you know, on your career? You know, I'm, I'm not sure I could say there's any one individual because when I think about my career, I think about kind of different phases. And I think about my first boss, Sonny Monison, when I was at the FNEC, and he was profoundly impactful. He was such a smart guy and quirky in a lot of ways, but he taught me to look at things differently and he taught me really um, analysis. And, and understanding companies and understand company drivers, not just the financial, but look beyond the financial. Um, and then I think about Stephen Gray, who was my boss at Recovery Group, and he was also such a, a patient, kind, bright guy. And he allowed me opportunities to get into company operations and really also expand knowledge and was very comfortable letting people you know, spread their wings and, and learn and, and make mistakes like mm-hmm. we all do. And then when I think about, you know, Alex Partners, I I think about Al Koch, who was the CEO here, and he's still involved with the firm, and how he has always had an open door and always a an ear to listen and very thoughtful about, you know, executive approaches and and management and managing multiple teams and, you know, work-life balance and, and all of that. So... I I would say because I look at it in phases, there's probably at least three and really many more that um, have helped me think about what I want to do and how I want to do it and, you know, kind of pulled me back if I was going the wrong way and and gave really good guidance and helped me kind of course correct. You know, you really don't want to do that (laughs) kind of thing. You are the uh, fifth participant or contributor to the Inside Track, you know, podcast series, but you are the first female participant on this series. And given that, I was wondering if in your experience, you know, the path or the challenge to becoming a successful restructuring advisor, in in your view or opinion, legal, financial, operational, so generally speaking, whether that path, you know, is different for men uh, compared to women, and whether you experienced sort of any differences as, you know, your career developed. Oh, I think it's dramatically different. I think that when you look across where the percentage of women that that are at a high level versus the percentage of men, it's it's very small. And I think that women do have to be better. Women do have to think about the way they approach really almost anything differently than men to make sure that they're they're not giving the wrong impression, that they're not misinterpreted. They have to be very careful and conscious about what they're wearing because it can be misinterpreted and it's unfortunate but it's but it's a fact and i think that we should have more women at this level and at the law firms and there are some great women across the industry that are out there and that are coming up through the ranks and i'm hopeful that you know, a couple of years from now, we won't be having a discussion that says, you know, you're the only woman out of so far. Um, but yeah, I think that the the challenges are a little bit different from women. Sometimes you, I mean, it doesn't happen to me now, but starting out in my career, of course, I would be in meetings and I would be the senior person and they'd look directly to the guy on my left mm-hmm. and ask him the question and I'd answer and then they'd still look to the guy on the left. Right. Or 
you know, I, you'd be called, you know, girly or whatever it, it would be that would suggest that you really don't have a right to be here. Why are you here kind of thing? And um, I'm hopeful that it's getting better. And I do think that it's getting better. But I don't think we can underestimate that it is different for women than it is for men, of course. Right. Are there any sort of specific things that you can think of, or at least what you've witnessed here, you know, at Alex Partners, that could help to resolve, you know, the gender parity issue that that you're describing, and the challenge, the you know, sort of additional challenges, or um, you know, the unwanted challenges that might exist for women compared to men? You know, I, I think um, when I think about it, Alex Partners, I think that actually, from a restructuring perspective, we have the most women in in senior leadership. We've got you know seven women partners, which is huge compared to any of the other practices. And we also have women coming up through the ranks. And I think that as a firm, diversity is a huge initiative. And it's not just gender diversity, it's, you know, ethnic diversity, it's diversity of thought, which I think is really important for really best results. What I can say what what I did, and the way that I look at it, and it may or may not work for everyone, but I never think of myself as just uniquely a woman. I never have, and I can't imagine I ever will, because the reality is nobody is just one thing. You're not just a man. You you may be a dad, you're a brother, you're a son, you're a, you're a journalist, and and that's the way I try to look at it is that, you know, people are complicated things, and there's multi-layers to it. And what I try to do is just as I don't want to be categorized as simply a woman, I don't want anyone else to be categorized as simply a man or simply something else. And what I usually find is once I don't let that become the only defining thing about me, the important things start to shine that, you know, I really do know what I'm doing and I really can help the situation, that kind of thing. Yeah. No, that's great advice. I want to pivot over or pivot back, I guess, to your career, perhaps discuss some specific instances or anecdotes of of your experience. I want you to try your best to recall back uh, to the first case uh, where it was finally your time, right, to run the show. Perhaps you were a partner, perhaps you were not yet there, but you had grown and developed. You were now, you know, leading the case on a daily basis, progressing it forward. Which case was it? You know, what was that experience like? And who perhaps were some of the other professionals, you know, that were involved in that case with you that, you know, might still be around today? I would say my first big case where I was running something by myself was probably XI Technologies, Mm -hmm. and that was 2001. And I was the chief financial and chief restructuring officer. So the professionals that I worked with, the... The lawyers were Kirkland and Ellis, so it was Jamie Sprayregan and team. The bankers were Blackstone, so it was Art Newman. Mm-hmm. The lenders were, oh man, um, Eaton Vance. Um, Jeff Aronson was at Angelo Gordon. I'm testing your memory. <laughs> um, Mark Shapiro, who was at Sherman and Sterling at the time, represented the the lender group. Mm -hmm. And who was the committee? Um, The committee was Bill Darrow when he was at Jeffries. And he, the counsel for the committee was Fred Hedera at Aiken Gump. Okay. How's that? That was excellent. (laughs) That was impressive. So A plus there. Um, So obviously, you know, huge case, huge name, Huge responsibility. What was it like? You know, what was that experience like as you reflect upon it? You know, it it was it was really wonderful. Actually, it it's I learned so much on that case. It was a large multinational, great professionals, lots of thorny issues that we had to figure out. Um, it was with Judge Lifflin. Hmm. Um, and he was a wonderful debtor judge yes. and just a just a wonderful you know guy to be in front of and you know we accomplished a lot from a transformation perspective you know we we it was it's a tough business it was a tough business it's still a tough business and um, there was a lot of consolidation there was a lot of operational work 
it was a case that went on. This was before the changes in the law, so it was a three-year case. Okay, yeah, so before 2005 and That's MAPSIPA right. and right, the revisions of the bankruptcy code. That's right, um, and I got to know a lot of great professionals and worked with a lot of great professionals that, as you said, are still around today, mm-hmm. some of them. Some of them, sadly, are not. But, um, you know, those are the kinds of cases that when you're in the trenches with other professionals, it it solidifies relationships. You start to realize working styles that work well with your style, um, negotiating styles that work well with your style. And, you know, you start to really figure out what you want to be as a professional in this space and how you want to conduct yourself and how, you know, what things work and what things don't work. Right. We can fast forward a little bit to perhaps a more recent engagement. Uh, Recently, you were involved in, I think, what can easily be described as a historic effort uh, to attempt to restructure the Puerto Rico uh, Electric Power Authority, otherwise known as PREPA, which is a government-owned utility provider located in the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. You served as the chief restructuring officer for PREPA for approximately two and a half years. And during that time, you were able to enter into a restructuring support agreement with major creditor groups. But unfortunately, the RSA, or maybe not unfortunately, but the RSA was ultimately uh, rejected by the oversight board that was then appointed uh, to monitor the Commonwealth's overall restructuring. Um, for those subscribers you know, who have not followed or may not have followed the situation closely, perhaps you can just walk us through a little bit the issues that kind of drove PREPA into distress, the RSA, why the oversight committee rejected it, and kind of more generally speaking, how that whole experience, given how PREPA was so intertwined into the overall Commonwealth's ability to restructure, how that differs, you know, from the other experiences you've had uh, with sea level roles, you know, in the U.S. That is such a complex question. <laughs> there's like <laughs> there's like five answers in there. So let me start with um, PREPA itself. PREPA is, of course, the the only power utility and power available on the island short of Um, solar capacity or people that have generators. So it is critically important to the island, its economy and the health and welfare of the the, the citizens. PREPA is a utility that suffered from really decades of of neglect as far as, you know, under-investment in in capital and really just maintaining the the plants, the transmission and distribution network. And it also suffered from years of kind of, you know, political battles. One of the challenges that you have when you've got a public corporation and the way that the structure was set up is that the administration put in place the top executives that ran the organization. And one of the challenges that Puerto Rico has suffered from for the last several decades is every four years, the administration changes. Mm -hmm. So every four years, top management changes. That makes it really difficult from a long-term planning perspective when you need investment in, you know, with a 10, 15, 20-year perspective. So that's part of what got PREPA to kind of the disarray that that people are, are witnessing now. How we got involved is they essentially ran out of cash and needed to get relief from their creditors. And the creditors said, we'll talk with you, but you must bring in a CRO to help navigate through this process. Mm -hmm. So there was a competitive process where I flew down and met with the board of PREPA. And I know there were three or four others that that did the same thing. And ultimately, I was selected. So PREPA was a very challenging situation. And it was challenging not just because of the operational challenges and the financial challenges. It was challenging because it is so important to the island. And a lot of islanders have a very emotional feeling about PREPA, either very positive, very strong, nationalistic, or very negative. We pay too much for our electricity. But I don't think there's anyone on the island that doesn't have a feeling one way or another about PREPA. So it was very emotional and very high profile for a lot of people. Right. It also impacted right the other 
sort of public you know, facilities that were also in distress, right, in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico, PREPA is only a small piece of the $70 billion, you know, yeah, that the Commonwealth had. And for PRASA, you know, some of the other, you know, organizations there, they all relied upon the electricity that was being provided by PREPA. So what happens to PREPA impacts not only right, the people, as you said, but the I imagine all the other organizations that also had their own distress situations going on. And businesses. Yeah. And, and you bring up an excellent point because the other challenge that PREPA had is because they were servicing the other agencies and the other public corporations, but they weren't getting paid. Mm-hmm. So that also exacerbated the the credit problems that they had and the cash problems that they had. And then when they, it's it's kind of a cycle. When they yeah. got unreliable, the people they were relying on to pay them were also unreliable. So they then weren't getting paid. So just just a tough, a tough situation. And being an island commonwealth, it's really the only source of power that they had. Mm-hmm. So critical that something be done, critical that we were successful and critical that we work to improve them and, in my view, critical that at least we were able to get an agreement among all the stakeholders and that was not easy because they all had very, very different perspectives. I'm sure. And at least demonstrate that a deal could be had. Right. may not have been the perfect deal. Mm-hmm. And with the benefit of a year and a half looking back and knowing what happened with the hurricane, it wasn't the perfect deal. But it was a consensual deal that could have provided a bit of a framework on on how to move forward. Mm-hmm. You know, in your opinion or thoughts, how does or how can, you know, PREPA move forward? Obviously, it's filed for, you know, restructuring under, I believe, Title Three of PROMISA, which was the new uh, law that was enacted, uh, given all the issues that Puerto Rico had of whether or not it could file um, under the U.S. Bank- bankruptcy code for in- insolvency relief, which was gone, which went up to the Supreme Court. Um, so how, you know, so again, so how do or, or how could you see, you know, PREPA ultimately reorganizing and coming out of this? Well, I think it's it's critical, and I always thought it was critical in our plan depended on this as well, that investment and that they, they upgrade the system. And it, it's not just renewables. It's, it's really baseload that's required as well. And it's a grid transformation and it's, transform, it's the transmission and distribution as well. So in order for PREPA to exit and be sustainable, it, it does require investment. I think everybody agrees. The question is, does it come in in a public-private partnership? Does it is it fully privatized? Is it you know, some sort of investment, but that is positively critical that PREPA is um, is allowed to, you know, upgrade. The, the average age of those units are 45 years old, mm. something something like that. Right. So that, that's got to be a key element of whatever is resolved as far as the debt and the obligations is making sure that there is capital investment and liquidity available in whatever form from an ownership structure they figure out that is, is key in my view. Let's uh, switch gears a little bit. We'll stay within the sort of the power grid, but move over from electrical to nuclear. Uh, currently, you are involved in restructuring Westinghouse. It's one of the largest and highest profile turnarounds, you know, that we've seen in the last couple of years. Explain for us your role and and perhaps, you know, what differentiates your experience at Westinghouse and this restructuring from some other restructurings that you've done. Westinghouse, um, I am the Chief Transformation and Development Officer, and um, the reason why the CEO chose that title is he wanted us to not focus just on cost-cutting, but also strategy and top-line growth. But it was funny, in my first day testimony in front of the judge, he's looking at my title, and he's like, explain what that is. And I started <laughs> to say it, and he stopped me, and he goes, is it a CRO? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so so it's, it's, it's a CRO plus a little plus, more. Right. Um, and so the the role has been great. Um, the management team there has been really great to work with. Um, Jose Gutierrez, who's the CEO, knew immediately in order for the transformation that we were working on to be successful, that it was important that I be part of his WEC staff team and that we work together as well with his um, other direct reports on putting together an integrated plan that was long dated, that was strategic in nature, but also we took the opportunity to transform the business and 
try to modernize it and, you know, the technologies, the processes, the culture and focus on on savings, focus on initiatives, focus on helping them think about things in a lot of different ways. So we put together a plan and Westinghouse was a very fast bankruptcy. It was within 12 months where we became effective. The piece that's lagging now is the regulatory mm -hmm. requirements. Um, so during that time, we took out annualized savings of over $200 million. Um, we right-sized the organization. We recruited in, you know, new talent, worked with the team on organizational structure, and also sold the business. And Brookfield was the ultimate buyer, got it through confirmation, negotiated with Toshiba, got, got them taken care of, negotiated with two owners of the... Um, construction plants, one in South Carolina, one in Georgia, and the disposition of what's what's happening there, and um, you know, dealt with the various regulatory bodies, and also ring fenced and protected the EMEA operations that didn't go into bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. So Westinghouse, in my view, and I'm so proud of the team and you know the work with the other professionals, while Gotchel, um, PJT, Scadden, our board. It was a really good example of everybody, you know, working together and thinking strategically and moving fast through a situation, and it's it's a great result. A lot of our, you know, panelists uh, have given us sort of their thoughts on the current credit cycle. Um, they've given us thoughts on perhaps the potential impact of the recent tax law. Any thoughts you care or any, you know, anything you care to share on your outlook of, you know, where we are in the current credit cycle, future, you know, recession possibilities and anything that's kind of on the horizon, you know, for companies who might be in distress now? You know, we're, we're seeing a lot of activity out there. I wouldn't say they're necessarily bankruptcies, but what we are seeing is underperforming in certain sectors. And we're seeing situations where there's kind of technological dislocation and it's causing winners and losers. So we're seeing a lot of opportunity there. The other thing that I'm finding interesting this time, I number one, everyone knows that interest rates are going up. It's a question of how much and when. There is a little bit of tightening at the at the Fed level. So the the positive trend that I'm seeing is forward-thinking management teams reaching out earlier, not because they're in crisis. They may not even yet be underperforming. They may not be underperforming, but what they are seeing is looming maturities mm -hmm. and want to try to get ahead of too much leverage and a possibility that in 2019 they may have a hard time refinancing. So we've got several clients like that, which I applaud those management teams. They're, they're thinking so far ahead. And it's great because they're dealing with their leverage and they're dealing with it in, you know, a very positive operational way and saying, you know, help us deal with this, help us, you know, cut costs, help us be more efficient because we've got this looming maturity in 2019. Mm -hmm. So I'd say that's a little different this time around. We're still seeing lots of opportunities in retail. Um, yep. We're seeing opportunities in shipping, transportation, healthcare, energy. Right. Final question for the podcast today. It's the same question that I ask of all of our panelists on the the inside track. What is the key piece of advice that you would like to offer to young practitioners in the distressed restructuring space? Don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, sometimes I feel that some of our our young, you know, entry level folks are intimidated by some of the more senior MDs or the senior professionals. Making there is no stupid question. We all started there. We we all went through not not having the answers, and in fact, even now, often we don't have the answers. We have to think about it or or figure it out. So, I would say, make sure you ask questions and don't be afraid to speak up. And good luck. It's it's a great career and it's a lot of fun. <laughs> well, that is all the time that we have for the podcast today. I'd like to again thank Lisa for joining us on this journey down uh, memory lane. Thank you. I hope that uh, I hope that you enjoyed it. I know yeah, that our fun. I know that our subscribers will enjoy it. And until next time.